1. Hello and welcome back to the new episode of The Arrow. A couple of years ago, I was backpacking in Europe when I luckily attended a Balkan show of a singer called Yulia Dumitrache. And uh, soon when the show started, a song started playing called Eder Lazy. And uh, it made me somehow go back in time without a time machine. I felt as if that uh, song somehow I know from my past life or something. And when I uh, went back to the hotel room, I then researched about the song and I came to know a term called Romani people. Uh, it was fascinating to me, but uh, the thing which was even more fascinating was that most of the Indians do not know about it or about them. So when I started this podcast, I somehow reached out to our guest today and uh, who is a historian in this field and more about it, we will know and ask directly from her. So Chandni, welcome to our podcast. Uh, tell us and our viewers about you. What do you, what do, you do and uh, what made you become a historian and how you did it? Hello, I'm Chandani Roshani. I am a, an elder Roma woman and I, my family has retained the, the old traditional beliefs, uh, including our religious beliefs, which are a form of Hinduism and our traditional magic. And I was motivated to become a historian uh, as well as a linguist of our language because there is so much incorrect information floating around out in the world about us. Um, along with a couple of my friends and relatives, I founded a few years ago an organization called the Indoor Romani Vidyalaya, which is, as its name suggests, a, uh, a school or, or a university for preserving the traditional Romani knowledge and for researching and preserving our history and the knowledge of our language. I have been writing extensively on uh, Romani topics for the last several years, and I am also in the process of writing two books. Um, one is documenting the very old dialect of the Romani language that I speak, and the other is a, uh, a recording of our traditional cultural practices, our old beliefs before a lot of the Roma converted to either Christianity or Islam, um, and our, our traditional cultural practices. I, I hope both of those books will be finished and published within the next two or three years. I wish you all the luck for those books and uh, I, I will surely want to read those books. Thank you. Shani, <laughs> uh, tell me the history of the origin of Romani people and how did they get the same uh, sorry, how did the uh, did they get the name Roma or Romani? Okay, the our, our name um, is in the old dialects of our language is pronounced Roma with a, a retroflex R, and that's the clue to its origin. It's it's the caste name Roma. Um, in our language, the retroflex D always changes to retroflex R. So, for example, in the Romani language, for a spoon, we see a roi. Um, for a bird, we see chiriklo. So you, you, I'm sure you can you can hear the similarity with the Hindi words in those examples. But the the retroflex D always becomes uh, a retroflex R in in Romani, and therefore the caste name Roma has shifted to Roma. But I also I have heard a term of some people call a Romani. Are they related, or does that mean something? No, that, that's that's something very different. The 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 Aromani or Aromanians are a Romanian group. Uh, people very often mix up Roma and Romanians, uh, particularly because there's a, a lot of uh, Roma settled in Romania, and in fact the Romanian people enslaved us for many centuries. But we are not in any way connected. The the similarity of name is a complete coincidence. The, the name Romanian comes from Latin, Romana, because it's part of the Roman Empire, whereas our name comes from the caste named Orma. Um, so it's a big, big confusion. But our Romanians are a, a Romanian group. And as such, they are, they are white Europeans 
who speak a Latin language, whereas of course we are ethnic Indians who speak uh, a language very similar to Hindi or Punjabi. Uh, well, as you were explaining about how the Roma people got their name as a Roma or Romani, so when before this discussion I was curious and I was trying to read somewhat about the Romani people. I could not get more content, but uh, through the Wikipedia, what I understood is they are also known as Indo-Aryan and traditionally they were like nomadic people uh, living mostly in the Europe, Europe country that is a uh, central part. And it also suggests linguistic and some genetic evidences that uh, uh, these are people originated from the Northern Indian subcontinent. Uh, but at present, I see the uh, like most of the population concentrated on the Europe. Europe. So I would like to understand how did they reach to Europe and what route they took to go there. Okay, that's uh, that's best answered by studying our language. If you listen to the Romani language, it's very clearly a sister language of. Punjabi and Hindi. For example, if I if I want to say that my hair is black in Romani, I would say Miribala Kalihin, which is almost Hindi. Yeah. Um, and of course, that demonstrates our our origin from northwestern India, uh, what's now uh, separated, I suppose, into India and Pakistan. Our DNA traces back principally to Punjab and Rajasthan. And if you look at for our, our appearance and also our culture, how we dress, you'll see that, that we do have very close parallels with the culture of Punjab and Rajasthan, as well as the linguistic uh, similarity. Um, if you then look at the, the borrowings in our language, the words that we've borrowed from the countries that we've traveled through, you will find that there are, there are Persian loanwords. We came through Persia. There are Armenian loanwords. We entered Europe via Armenia. Turkish words, we went south into Turkey. Then Greek, um, then Romanian. And then the, the dialects of the Balkans stopped there, basically, in sort of Greece, Romania, Yugoslavia, that part of the world. But then the, the Western Roma, which is the group that I come from, continued on further. We went through Hungary, Germany and France. So I have in my dialect Hungarian, German and French words as well. The, although the, the language is still 85 or 90 percent Indo-Aryan. So our, the map of our migration is actually written into our language, which I think is beautiful. Uh, Chandni, I have a question which is uh, not what we discussed earlier, but I think I forgot. Why did uh, Roma people leave India at the first place? Oh, that's a great question and one that, that has been discussed endlessly among ourselves. Um, the, the honest answer is we don't know exactly, but every tribe has some sort of origin story that talks about our ancestors doing something terrible and being banished and condemned to, to wander the world as nomads, to atone to the gods for, for whatever the sin is. The, the, the exact details of, of what we did wrong does vary between tribes, but it does seem that we annoyed the, the ruling castes at some time in the past and we were sent away. Uh, so you mean that it was just because of caste difference or not because it's, by the kings or tribal heads? Caste, caste, I'm sure, plays a large part in it because, because we are very obviously of low caste origin. But the, the version of the story that exists in my clan um, says that what happened was that we, ha we fought with the rulers. We wouldn't um, accede to their rule. We wouldn't do what they wanted. And because we had skills in magic, they were frightened of us because we could, we could use magic combatively against them. And because of that fear, they sent us away. It's very possible. There's all of these different origin stories that talk about different sins may all be correct because we didn't leave India in one single migration. 
we left in several migrations over a fairly long period. And so very likely we are a combination of different low caste groups who were kicked out of India at different times in history uh, for slightly different reasons, who all traveled west and all met up in the Balkans. Uh, again, if you look at our language, which is the best source we have for our history, the dialects of our language show that some of the groups clearly left India at different times and from slightly different regions of India. Some of the differences we have in our dialects are simply because of borrowings from European languages, of course, but many of them can be traced back to, to our, our Indian roots. And that also our genetics shows that we don't come from one single group who left on one single occasion. So very likely all of the origin stories are reasonably true that we are a group of different low caste people who were banished from India for annoying various rulers at various times. So when do you think that uh, this uh, migration uh, all started? I mean, do you have a tentative uh, time frame when this yes. started? The, the uh, beginning of the migration would have been in the, the latter part of the first millennium after Christ. So maybe something like 700, 800, 900. Um, and the, the last of the migrations probably was well into the second millennium. Um, probably could have been as late as 1400 or 1500. So it's over quite an extended period. So uh, for 1400, 1500 years, probably the situations might be quite same. That's why these there are many waves and that's yes. how this started. Yes. And I, I think it's highly likely that some of the later migrations out of India may have been provoked by the arrival of Muslim invaders and the big social changes that happened in Northern India as a result of that. So if you don't mind me asking, uh, what do you think, when did your clan st uh, start migrating from India? Uh, my ancestors must have been among the very first to leave India because we have historical evidence that my ancestors were in Western Europe by 1500. Mm -hmm. and and if you look again, we look we look at the language because that's our history book. The dialect of Romani that I speak has a great deal of Romanian influence as well as the other influences that I listed. So we must have spent quite some time in the Balkans to collect that much influence on our language. And so if you work it back, knowing that we reached Western Europe before 1500, we must have been one of the first groups out of India before 1000 AD. I see. Okay. Well, Chandni ji, I'll just go back to my the last question. Continuation to that, I would like to understand, as you also mentioned that the migration did not happen in a altogether in a one time. It has happened in different time periods. And like you have told that uh, 1500 years ago, they have reached in the Western Europe. But I also read about that there are some Romani people in 19th century who have migrated to the USA also. That's correct, so, yes. Yeah, so uh, how far they did travel? I would like to understand. Um, nowadays, you will find it almost everywhere in the world. Um, even as long ago as the 1500s, uh, Roma were sent to the Americas and the Caribbean, South America, North America, and the Caribbean islands as slaves. We, we were enslaved in Europe. Um, and more recently, as you say, in the 19th century and the 18th century, um, Roma escaped from the racism in Europe, where in many parts of Europe we are treated very badly, and went to start new lives in America, uh, also in Australia, the, the first uh, Roma to reach Australia were sent as prisoners in the 18th century, but more recently uh, Roma have left Europe and gone there voluntarily. Um, I myself have relatives in New Zealand and America, and you, you will find uh, Roma people really all over the world now. There's also two very interesting uh, Roma groups who migrated 
back east from Europe, um, almost back home to India. There's this one group who came west along with, they're actually a branch of the group that I come from, who headed west from the Balkans. They got as far as Poland and then they turned back east, made a long loop through Russia and ended up in Kazakhstan. And even though they, they've gone so far east that they're almost back home, they speak a dialect of Romani that is very, very like my dialect, which is a Western European dialect of Romani. So that's, and there's an, another similar group um, called the Zagari, who, who are found in Iran. And similarly, they are a group of Roma who migrated back eastwards from the Balkans, settling in Iran, and they speak a, a dialect of Romani that is very similar to the Balkan dialects. I find that very interesting that those two groups almost went back home. Okay. <clears throat> as you were saying that there were many different waves all all throughout the time and uh, when i was doing my research i came to know that uh, there are uh, several different tribes in romas so uh, can you tell me that what are the different tribes in romas for example i have heard of uh, roms uh, sindhi kaldarash and uh, are there some more and uh, when were these tribes were formed was it uh, ha has it started when uh, the migration actually started or it happened after the migration when they settled somewhere in Europe and what was the reason behind the formation of separate tribes altogether? Uh, some of the tribes, uh, their origins go back to India. Uh, other tribes split and recombined after we reached Europe. Um, there are so many tribes that I can't, I can't list them all. Um, our dialect, actually, our language, I'm sorry, has more than 1,000 different dialects. So even someone like myself, who's a linguist of Romani, from time to time, I hear a new dialect of Romani that I've never heard before. Um, we have so many tribes, sub-tribes and clans, it's very hard to keep track of them all. Um, we use the word uh, Roma as a sort of umbrella term for all of the tribes. The, the Sinti are actually part of the Roma. And interestingly, this is something that a lot of people don't know, even our own people often don't know this, but until quite recently, the 20th century, um, the words Roma and Sinti were used interchangeably by some of the tribes, particularly the, the two tribes that I descend from, called themselves either Sinti or Roma, and the, the fixing of the name into either Sinti or Roma happened very recently. Um, names such as Kaldarash are, tri are tribes within the overall grouping of Roma. The Kaldarash are a metalworking tribe. They descend principally from the Gadiloha of India. And they, they brought um, Indian metalworking knowledge that was far more advanced than anything that Europe had uh, 500 years ago to Europe and so they became famous metal workers, expert, um, expert makers of uh, pots, cauldrons, samovars and weapons. Uh, some of the Kaldarash groups became weapon makers to the Turkish Ottoman Empire. Others settled in the Balkans and made their money and still make their money making pots, kettles, samovars, jewellery and so on. Um, other tribes are more specialised in music, for example, and music is a very, very big part of our traditions for all tribes, but there are some tribes who are particularly musicians. There are other tribes who are more generalist. The, the group that I descend from are generalists, and our historically, our main ways of making money were what we called it the, the three M words, music, magic, and metal. Uh, I actually, I myself do all of those three things, as well as being a, a historian and linguist. I mean, I'm a musician, I'm a skilled metal worker, and I practice the traditional magic. And I still make good money practicing our traditional magic, in fact. Uh, I, I've seen uh, you on your Facebook uh, 
once you sh- uh, shared a picture with you in a workshop and you showed that you have made some walls or something by your right. own hands and uh, yeah it it is amazing uh, just uh, an anecdote that when i was a kid during summer time uh, mostly during uh, from may to june there were caravans which used to come in my hometown and they always come and uh, they use our old metal plots pots uh, mostly of aluminum or copper and they used to make uh, uh, quite beautiful uh, statues out of them and uh, do you know something about that or are they related to the roma people also because i think the uh, the artistry and the skill is set is quite similar as you were telling just before i am i'm sure they would be related to us i mean cert- i i know for for certain that that part of our ancestry is from the gadi lohar but the, we have many other um components of our ancestry from different nomadic tribes of india um i i i'm afraid i don't know all of the nomadic tribes of india but as far as i the research i have done has shown that we are uh, very much a mix of different nomadic tribes and that does sound so much like something that that we would do to recycle um rubbishy old metal into something beautiful um that i i feel sure that they would be relatives of ours i mean i i think my parents still have that those statues and they are quite beautiful mm-hmm. still so uh, what, uh i have one uh, more question to ask that when do you do actually get into the historical studies of roma people or what, has it always been uh, in your mind when you were a kid or it started uh, to grow into you when you grew up a little bit i've always been interested in the history of my own family and my own clan because i was chosen to uh, when i was very very small to become chavahani which is the the worker of magic and one of the one of the other roles that the chavahani traditionally has is being a a rememberer uh, an oral historian because until very recently all of us were illiterate i am only the second generation of my family to who could read and write and i'm the first who who had higher education so traditionally we depend on memory for retaining our history and our knowledge of who we are and our knowledge of all our skills and so i was taught the family history and the clan history when i was very small by my grandmother and so that i think primed me to be interested in uh, roma history more generally and then when the internet came along which made it much easier for me to get into contact with other roma all over the world um that grew into my projects to write down what i know about our language and our history and try to look further back into time to establish our ancient history establish exactly what happened when we left india and and the other things that we've been talking about in this interview i see uh, you were just saying that uh, it is uh, like uh, everybody every generation memorize some things and then pass it on to the next generation so what form was it in is it in the form of poems songs or uh, the mu festival music or festival songs what, how how was it uh, transferred from one generation to another um mostly stories um they, we we have a, a very strong tradition of storytelling and always we make clear when we tell a story whether it's a true story uh something that happened to our ancestors or whether it's a a fictional story uh even the fictional stories very very often teach important information for example they teach about morality correct behavior our old beliefs so we have a lot of um morality tales in which somebody does something wrong and they get their karma for it uh and and that's the way that we teach our children about what behavior is acceptable and what behavior is bad uh, can, can you uh, tell us some uh, story a short story about yes, morality I-, i just want to check that if it is similar to some of our stories which our grandparents or parents told us okay uh, one day a uh, uh, a dishonorable uh, roma man had gone into the town 
he'd got drunk and been a nuisance and he bought himself a new knife and he was showing off with this knife and being loud and troublesome. He was walking back through the forest to find his caravan and uh, waving his new knife around and he said, I swear on the gods that this knife will kill my greatest enemy. And he was, as he walked to the forest, the spirits of the forest heard what he said. And they knew that he was dishonorable. He had hurt many people. He had treated his wife badly. He was really not a good person. Somehow the spirits tripped him on a tree root. So he fell. As he fell, the knife that he was holding stabbed him through the stomach. And as he lay bleeding on the ground, dying, his last thought was to understand that he was his own greatest enemy because he was Bipativalo, dishonorable. And that's why the spirits had punished him. What was the term you used? Vipativalo, right? Bipativalo, yes. Yeah, uh, I think in Hindi, Vipati or Bipati means uh, a problem or something like that. Yes, Abhimanyu? Yes. Yeah, problem. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I understand. In, in, in our language, party means means honor, and the um, any any word prefixed with b, it's like say it's like v in Sanskrit. It means mm -hmm. the opposite. It's the opposite. So so pativ is honor. Pativalo means honorable, and bipativalo means dishonorable. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, it's uh, it it it's it makes totally sense now. And uh, it's quite good that you are a linguistic. Maybe uh, uh, some after some weeks or months, we'll call you again. We will just talk about linguistics. Today, we will just know from you about Roma people. And okay, yeah. yeah. So uh, now uh, uh, another question, which I always see that uh, Romania as a country is always associated with uh, Roma people, and uh, mm -hmm. it is not new. It is, I think, since the day I was born, uh, I I have heard that. Okay, uh, Roma, Roma, Romania has many Roma people. So, why is it uh, the why is it this the case that Romania is always associated with Roma? People? There are there are two parts to that. One is a, a simple confusion because of the similar name, um, even though that's a complete coincidence. But there are a, there are a lot of Roma people in Romania, and the reason for that is that several centuries ago, probably five or six hundred years ago the Romanians enslaved the, the Roma who had arrived in the Balkans and they set us to work, working on the farms, working in the churches, working in the monasteries. The um, Romanian Orthodox Church was the, the biggest user of slaves. And so we remained as slaves in Romania right up until 1856 when we were finally released. So there has always been a large population of Roma in Romania. They descend from the slaves and unfortunately still they are treated very badly in Romania. There's also an additional confusion because in Romania they enslaved a great many people who were not Roma and they, they called all of these slaves Tsigani, which is usually translated into English as gypsies, but actually it means slaves in Old Romanian. And so there's a, a bit of a confusion between the non-Roma ex-slaves and the Roma. There are many people in, in Romania who are Tsigani, descendants of slaves, but they're not Roma. And it does get very confusing trying to sort that out. Uh, so, one more thing which I came to know is that apparently there was a holocaust of Roma people also. And uh, I, I have always heard the, uh, about the holocaust of obviously Jews, but uh, never heard of the Roma people, probably because in the news, Jews were more prevalent at that time. So can you tell us about the history of that and how and when it happened? Yes, it was just like the holocaust of the Jews. It was done by the Nazis in the 1930s and 40s. Um, they regarded Roma as being subhuman, 
and so they decided that they would eliminate eliminate us just the same as they wanted to eliminate the Jews and so they they rounded up the Roma some were sent to concentration camps and killed they were treated very badly others were simply shot where they were found so we we simply don't know how many people really died among the Roma but the the lowest estimate that is believable is two and a half million and I have heard estimates as high as seven or eight million certainly we know that more than half probably three quarters of the Roma in Europe were killed by the Nazis and many entire dialects of our language were lost forever because the Nazis actually killed every single speaker of those dialects and across the uh, the allies of the Nazis also they did the same thing so for example in Romania there was a, a fascist government in the Second World War um, and they imprisoned their Roma in camps in Transnistria and many of them were killed. Um, my, my family my, on, on my father's side at that time were living in France. Many of them were rounded up and killed by the Nazis. And if I, in fact, I don't know any Roma in Europe who didn't lose someone in the, in the Holocaust. Literally every family that I know was touched by, by the Holocaust. And that is a, a very little known chapter in history. And I feel that it's one that deserves to be better known. We've been unfortunately subjected to very severe racism and genocide ever since we arrived in Europe. The genocide by the Nazis was not the only one. The probably the first real genocide against us was in what's now Germany. In those days, it was called the Holy Roman Empire in the 1500s. The, the ruler at the time decreed that uh, Roma were not human because we were not white, we were not Christian, we spoke a different language. And they actually encouraged and even paid the, the German people to hunt and kill us like animals. There were many, many Roma were killed at the same period under witchcraft laws because our traditional magic was seen as witchcraft. Um, so many uh, Roma women particularly were, were hanged or burned or mutilated and unfortunately the, the, these uh, events of violence continued even into modern times. The most recent genocide on the Roma was during the 1990s in Yugoslavia. As Yugoslavia fell apart and the different groups there started fighting each other, unfortunately several of the groups attacked the Roma and about 30,000 uh, Roma were killed in Yugoslavia. Uh, again that's almost unknown outside of our own communities. So like I have seen many, many memorials for uh, the for the Jews who were who died in Holocaust. Is there any memorial for uh, Roma people also somewhere in Europe? There, there is now. They finally, in 2012, a memorial was opened in central Berlin um, to recognize the, the Roma Holocaust. And there are small memorials in other places. There's one in Poland, I know. And there, there, there is, uh, is talk of constructing one in the Czech Republic, but that hasn't been done yet, as far as I know. But it's taken a very, very long time to get any recognition of what happened. And in fact, as recently as the 1980s, when I was a young woman, the German government was denying that there ever had been any genocide of a Roma. Uh, it was only really quite recently that they finally acknowledged that it happened. Nice. Okay. Uh, well, Chandiji, I was uh, trying to understand the regarding the religion or belief of Roma people. So I was just trying to read and found out some facts, like some of the Roma people uh, believe in Christianity, 
like who are in the uh, European part, some of they also believe in Islam, like uh, 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 people are in Turkey or somewhere. And even they also believe in the Hinduism. So I just wanted to understand, is there a separate religion or be, some fundamental belief of Roma people? Or they just uh, believe in based on the their geographical location where they are now. So they started following that. And if there is a fundamental belief, since the origin is basically, as we have discussed, it is from Indian subcontinent. So if they believe in some religion, is that different from or similar to the Indian religion? The original Romani belief system, the Purapachpin, which means old faith, is a mixture of Hinduism and um, Indian animism. It's very similar to the mixed beliefs that some of the other scheduled tribes of India have. So we have uh, a number of deities that are very obviously of Hindu origin. For example, we, we, we have um, Barma, who is Brahma, obviously, Shiva, um, Vishnu, who is Vishnu, of course. Um, we still have the word Trimurti for them. Um, we have Kalisara Devi, who is our, our top goddess. She's Durga. And the reason we call her, we, well, Kali is obvious, Sara is a corruption of the word of the old name for Durga, which is Sharika, which I believe is still used in some parts of Kashmir, even now. Um, we have Kali, who is closely related to Kali Sara Devi. Um, we have Yandra, who is Indra. And um, we have Kam, who is Surya. We, we use the word Kam for sun, um, similar to Nepali, where in, in Nepali it's Kam. In, in Romani, it's Kam. Um, we have also a uh, goddess of the earth. This is where we start to be different a little from mainstream Hinduism. We have a goddess of the earth called Puv. That's Bumi in Sanskrit, of course. It becomes Puv in Romani. Um, but we also have, we have two Hindu gods that have become goddesses, interestingly. So Agni, in mainstream Hinduism is replaced by Yag in our pantheon and she is the goddess. She's very important because for nomadic people fire is essential. If you don't have fire you die if you're traveling of course. So Yag is, is one of our most important deities. The other one that has become female is our deity of air and wind who we call Baval. Um, that's a change from Bhavana. So um, again, for some reason, she has become a goddess. We then have the animistic part of our belief system where we believe that everything, um, plants, trees, rocks, places, all have their own dukkha or spirits. And some of them can be very helpful. Some of them can be bad. Um, some of them, for example, the spirits of water, the Nivashya, can be, if you're, if you're respectful to them, they can be very helpful. But if you disrespect them, they can turn nasty and they can hurt you. Um, so that, that's a very, very quick overview of our traditional belief system. But in the time that we've been in Europe, we came under a great deal of pressure to take on the local beliefs. In the Muslim world, in the parts of Europe that were occupied by the Turks until the 20th century, we were given financial encouragement to become Muslim. So uh, if we became Muslim, we paid less tax and were given social advantages. And so in that part of the world, a lot of Roma became Muslim, although they very often keep a lot of the traditional Indian beliefs in parallel. With, with Islam. In the Christian world, we were treated much worse. Uh, I've mentioned already the, the persecution by the Holy Roman Empire and the fact that the Orthodox Church in Romania enslaved us. In many parts of Europe, because we were being persecuted and killed for being different, a lot of Roma 
converted to Christianity in return for staying alive because the Christians would stop killing us if we became Christian. Again, very often the old beliefs do exist quietly in parallel with Christianity. Um, I myself have, I have uh, at least one relative who mixes the two belief systems. On her altar, she has Jesus and Mary, but also she has uh, Shiva and Kali and a few of the other uh, Indian deities. Other clans have converted entirely to Christianity and sadly they have completely forgotten the old Indian beliefs. And there are some clans all over the world, like my own, who have completely kept the old beliefs and never adopted either Islam or Christianity. Um, Janni, um, right now we are talking about religion. Uh, do you have any festivals which uh, which are related to uh, the festivals right now celebrated in India? For example, the biggest one of them is Holi and Diwali. And obviously there is a, a festival called Navratri. That is the festival for obviously uh, the biggest god is Goddess Durga and Kali. So do you also celebrate this type of festivals? And if yes, then what are they called? It, it varies a lot between tribes. Certainly among those of us who keep the old beliefs, we do have celebrations, but they've, because we lost the Vikrami calendar, because it's too complicated to calculate if you're Ill illiterate, we no longer have the, the lunar dates for the celebrations. And very commonly they have got combined with local um, non-Christian celebrations. So for example, my, my grandmother's clan spent a long period in Ireland. And so their beliefs got mixed with Irish pagan beliefs. So for example, we, uh, we celebrate Diwali at the time that the Irish pagans celebrate Samhain, which is, it's a very, has a very similar meaning. It's celebrated at the end of October. It's a festival of lights. And for the, um, for the Irish pagans, it's their new year. Um, and so because of the sim that similarity, it got combined in our traditions. Um, likewise, at the beginning of May, the, the Irish pagans hold a fertility festival called Beltane. And so, so we celebrate Shivaratri. Um, at that time, I know it's the wrong time of year, but because it has such a similar meaning, uh, we combine them. And th these sort of combined traditions happen a lot in, in the Romani tradition because we've been in Europe for such a long time. Um, so for example, Edelese, which brings us back to the beginning of the interview, is not at all a traditional Indian belief. It's actually a Christian belief, but we've put our own um, Romani interpretation of it. Edelese is St. George in the Christian tradition, but in, in our old traditions, anything that looks like a, a frog or a, a toad or any kind of amphibian is seen as demonic, and that's obviously an Indian origin. And in fact, our, our word for a demon is Bengal if it's male and Bengi if it's female. And Bengo and Bengi are very, very old pre-Hindu deities that became demonized by the, when Hinduism came. And we've retained those words to refer to things that are magical and bad. And because St. George in the Christian tradition kills the dragon, to our ancestors who saw, who saw and heard that story of St. George and the dragon, we saw the dragon as being the as being Bengi, the, the personification of everything that's evil. And therefore St. George um, was seen by the, the early Christian Roma as being a, a very, very powerful guardian saint because he could destroy all evil. And that's why Adelaide is uh, so important to the Roma in the Balkans. Ah, 
it seems all pretty interesting to me and that's why sometimes i feel that when i heard that song either lazy I, I, why i felt as if i am connected to it somehow i even uh, started writing a fictional story or fictional novel about it that somehow i went in uh, with a time machine in the past and i became a roma person i have not finished it it just started it was a good idea at that time in my mind sounds good but, yeah <clears throat> Uh, but uh, while you were telling us about the name of gods of shiva brahma and uh, the holy trinity uh, i was thinking about especially the language we have touched this topic in the past uh, in during this interview itself about uh, the linguistics so how uh, how does this uh, language or what does this language is called which roma people use probably there are many different languages for different tribes and uh, how different and similar is it to for example hindi punjabi sindhi and uh, i have also uh, read that many european uh, languages uh, loaned words from uh, this uh, roma language and also roma uh, roma language have loaned many words from european languages so uh, give me an overview about the language of roma people and europe altogether we we call our language romanes um in english it's known as romani um the other word the, the reason it's called romani in english is that the other way we can say it in our language is i romani chib which means the romani language of course chib in our language is the same word as jib in hindi tongue um our language has many different dialects but it is all one language it's closer to the prakrits and sanskrit than than to hindi and punjabi although we share at least 1500 words with hindi and i find that very often i can understand punjabi quite easily if the speaker speaks slowly and my punjabi friends mostly understand romani if i speak slowly there's uh, so many shared words even though the grammar is a bit different Uh, our grammar is much more old uh, for example our our verbs still conjugate the way that prakrit verbs conjugate so for example if you if you want to say i love that's if it's if it's i love it's kamava you love kamesa he or she loves kamela so uh, the, the, so it's it's different to the way that verbs conjugate in hindi much more much more old fashioned um although we have so many different dialects most of the differences really come down to the words they borrowed from european languages if you look only at the indian roots of the dialects they're really very similar we have borrowed a lot of words so for example my my own dialect has words from the balkans from uh, as well as from hungary germany and france because that's the migration that my ancestors took the dialects found in romania have very very many loans from romanian because they stayed in romania for so many centuries the dialects found in Hung- in hungary have very many hungarian loans and so on so we we always take loans from the languages that we are in contact with simply because all roma if they speak romani have to be bilingual because we have to interact with outsiders guys um so we have to be at least bilingual many of us speak three four or five languages because of needing to interact with people in different parts of europe and because of that it's very very natural for words from the european languages to cross over into our language uh similarly words from romani do cross over into european languages even english has romani words i think my my favorite english word that is of romani origin is lollipop and that's a corruption of lollipopai in romani which means literally a red apple and the reason for that is that decades ago Uh, a lot of the uh, roma women used to sell toffee apples 
apples covered with red toffee on a stick to the children to, to make a bit of money. I remember, in fact, helping my grandmother to do that when I was a little girl. When the, and they were called lollipabaya, red apples. When the candy lollipops came along, uh, they, they were so similar in appearance to the, the toffee apples that the Roma women sold, they, they got the same name and it passed into English as, as lollipop. I think that's rather nice. There are, there are quite a lot of other uh, words of Romani origin in, in English, mostly in, in slang, but in, in proper English, one very obvious uh, Romani word is kosh, which is uh, a, a club or a, an blunt instrument for hitting people with. And that's a corruption of the Romani word kash, which is kasta in Sanskrit. It means uh, a piece of a piece of wood, a log, or a, a branch of a tree. So it's uh, became in English a thing for hitting people with. Uh, Chani, I have a weird question right now okay. uh, because I am learning uh, Romanian. I have uh, mm -hmm. I love Romanian language and its music. But um, one uh, word I came to stumble upon is the word for snake in Romania is sharpe. Mm -hmm. And in, in Sanskrit or in Hindi, it's called sarp. What is it called in uh, Roma language? Sarp. 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 So it's, it's the, it follows the Sanskrit form. But in, in all of the languages of Europe and India, some of these basic words are very closely related. So... For example, the word for a snake in ancient Greek is herpes. Mm -hmm. the, the SH switch comes in, just as in Indian languages, S and H often become interchanged. In, in Latin, it's serpens, which is where the Romanian sharpe came from. So, but they're all, they all originate from the same word thousands of years ago. And that shows the, the shared heritage of Sanskrit with the European languages. Mm. And particularly, if, if you know Latin and ancient Greek and Sanskrit, the, the common origin of the three is very, very obvious. They are so similar. I would really love to go back in time and see how it evolved. Maybe in, obviously mm. fast forward, but it's fascinating me to me. <laughs> me too. Actually, I got one question regarding this language, a Roma language, when we are talking. See, like... Uh, uh, as you said, we adopt the bilingual language where we are uh, located because we have to interact with the people. I just want to understand, is there any part of the world where Roma language is recognized as an official language? Because, for example, in India, it is Hindi. In German, it is German. So how is recognized as an official language? Yes, some of the countries of Europe do recognize Romani officially uh, as a minority language. Uh, Romania does, Netherlands does, I believe Germany does, but I'm not certain. And certainly some of the Balkan countries also recognize Romani as, as an official minority language. And we do have a small number of uh, Romani language radio stations. Uh, probably the best known of those is Radio Romano, which is based in Sweden. And it's uh, operated and financed by the Swedish National Broadcasting Authority because there is there is a large uh, Romani minority in Sweden and so there we have our own radio station. Sunny, I'm a music lover and when I'm seeing some of the uh, music instruments behind you when I, got, when I got to know that you are a musician as well I'm very curious to know about the uh, no, Roma music and dance influence on European culture mm -hmm. and not especially dance and music? The, uh, our, our music has influenced a great many styles around the world. The most obvious one, I'm sure, is, is flamenco, which is very much of Romani origin. Even the word flamenco is a slight corruption of a Romani word. And of course, that's passed into the mainstream culture of, of Spain and Portugal. In 
South America, the, the Roma who were enslaved and sent out to South America took the Romani style of music, and that has influenced mariachi out there. In much of the Balkans, our music has influenced the local music, and I think also their music has influenced ours. So in some parts of the Balkans, you will hear Romani music that has a, a certain Turkish influence. In Greece, you will hear Romani music that has a, a Greek influence and, and so on. And that's, I, I think those, those mixed styles of music are actually very nice and they, they show a, a, a pleasant um, mixing and hybridization of the styles of music. And it, it means that our music is very, very um, eclectic. We have so many different styles of Romani music. Each, each tribe has, has its own style. And there are also modern styles as well as traditional styles where other cultures' music has, has fused with ours to, to create new styles. It's really interesting. So, Chani, uh, can you tell us about some famous personalities who are Roma? The, the famous Roma who I can think of are all musicians. Probably the one that everybody has heard of is Django Reinhardt. Um, who was actually a very distant cousin of me. Um, there's also Esme Rejepova, who died about five years ago. She's very, very famous, uh, very, very good. Shaban Bayramovic, who again died, died, oh, I think about 10 years ago. Um, there are a great many other uh, Romani musicians, of course, but th they are probably the, the three most famous who everybody would have heard of. Uh, unfortunately, because of the exclusion and uh, racism that we face in Europe, it's very difficult for Roma to um, achieve excellence and fame in other in other fields. So it's very very unusual for for to find, for example, Roma scientists or Roma doctors. There are a few, but um, as far as I can think, no one who is famous that everybody would have heard of. It's getting better now, but it's still still a long way to go before we have equality in Europe. Um, and in fact, in my, my own age group, which is late 50s, um, about 85% of Roma of my age are illiterate. Not because we don't want to learn, but because the situation in Europe has been so bad that very often we are excluded from school, we're excluded from work, we're excluded from healthcare, um, and it's just impossible to escape from poverty when, when we're treated like that. And that, that's part of the reason why really we only achieve fame by our music, because it's the one thing that outsiders cannot take away from us. Uh Jani, while you were talking about uh, that there are people who actually are not ready to assimilate you in their culture or in the country, uh, I was uh, also looking for the information and I found some documentaries about this, but they are quite old. So uh, can you tell me what is the current situation of Roma people in Europe, at least? It does vary. Some countries it's much better than others. For example, in Sweden and Norway, um, we really we are very well integrated. The, I, I myself lived in Norway for many years and I really didn't have any problems at all there. In, in Britain, the, there is very little difficulty. Of course, in Britain, we have the advantage that there's a very large Indian and Pakistani population. So we blend, we blend in and because the British mostly are familiar with seeing people of Indian heritage, there isn't much racism here. There is a bit, but it's, it's not terrible. But in much of Central and Eastern Europe, it's very, very bad. For example, in Czechia and Slovakia, even in the 21st century, they were forcibly sterilizing uh, Roma women because they were frightened. They didn't want us to have children. They wanted us to die out. Um, in fact, one of my close relatives fell victim to that. In many parts of Europe, we are 
forbidden to live in the white parts of town. If you look through any newspaper in Hungary looking for houses or flats to rent, it will, it will say no Roma, even though that's illegal um, under European law. They, they say that and it's basically impossible in that part of Europe for, for Roma to get a house and therefore most the Roma live in ghettos in terrible poverty. Most of these places don't even have water or electricity. They certainly don't have schools. They certainly don't have doctors. And so a lot of my people live in truly terrible conditions. And it breaks my heart that that ha is happening still in the 21st century. Yes, it is quite sad. And <clears throat> that uh, documentary, which I saw, uh, as I said, it was an old documentary. I also uh, saw that there is, first of all, a flag for Roma people, which I didn't know existed. And uh, is there uh, any uh, requirement or what should I say? Not requirement, but any uh, voice raised that Roma people want their own land or own country now that since they are so, so many and they want their life to be uplifted and not be... Uh, continuing at the same state because of prejudices. So the there certainly are several movements calling for a homeland for us. The the idea is controversial. I I myself oppose the idea of a homeland um, because we have had so much prejudice, so many so many genocides. If we were all together in one place, we just don't have the, the specialist people like doctors, architects, engineers that would be necessary to make a viable economy. And so, and so a, a nation of Roma would probably not succeed. It would probably simply sink into poverty, uh, which would be no good. So what I, what I would like to see is a, a large number of small areas in different countries set aside for Roma, where we can live among our own people, but we can use the services of that country for medicine, education, and so on. And we can interact, we can trade with the outsiders, we can do our music for them, we can do magic for them, whatever it might be, we can get education and uplift ourselves that way. There is in fact a place called Truko Arizari, um, just outside Skopje in Macedonia, uh, which has done exactly that for the last oh, 40 or 50 years now. Uh, it's a small uh, district which is entirely Roma, it's self-governing, it has a, a government of Roma, but it's part of Macedonia, so the Roma there have access to the services. I would like to see many more areas like that set up across Europe where we can live together, we can preserve our own culture, but we can also go to school, go to see the doctor when we need to, go to university and be uplifted in that way. I think that would be much more successful. And what about uh, the real home country of uh, the Roma people? What uh, is India doing for helping Roma people or are they doing anything? Sadly, not really. Um, a few years ago, the, there was talk of granting um, Indian origin status to Roma so that we would have similar rights to expatriate Indians, but that never happened. Mm -hmm. um, I, would, I would love to be recognized by, by my mother country. I, I certainly consider, like most Roma, that India is my true motherland. I would love to be recognized as an expatriate Indian, but sadly it hasn't yet happened. And nothing much has been done. Uh, and uh, what do you think? Uh, is there, because I have, uh, I have uh, seen and read that I think there is an organization who is represented, representing the Roma people. And is that organize, organization in the talks with EU and India to get something like a dual citizenship or something like that? And uh, what is your future expectation from India? I would, I would certainly hope that India would 
use its economic power and its political power to put pressure on the countries of Europe to treat us properly, to treat us equally with their white citizens. India is a, you know, is an economically very powerful land. It's very big, large population, and the economy is growing massively in the last few decades. It should be in a position to, to put pressure on some of these European countries. I, that, that's what I would like to see. As for organizations representing us, unfortunately, we have a problem there. There are very many organizations that claim to represent us, but very few of them really do represent us. The, the most notorious example of that is IRU, the International Rom Romani Union, which unfortunately, ever since it started in the 1960s, it has been led by people who are not Roma. Um, we have, we've had a, a very big problem, particularly with non-Roma traveling people, who we called Romale in our language, who have been trying to steal our identity for reasons of politics and money. And they have, in the main, the, the people who claim to represent the Roma are not Roma, but they are these uh, Romale. And so they really don't speak for us. And therefore you will find that the majority of Roma don't uh, respect organizations like Iru. What we need is organizations of our own that are led by Roma and truly speak for us. And there are many different efforts on the small local level to set up such things, but we don't have a big multinational organization that represents us, unfortunately. Yeah, that is rather unfortunate. Um... What should I know? Uh, say that uh, in this day and age of internet, probably soon the young uh, young generation of the Roma people uh, who are probably also more literate because as you said that you are the first one in your <clears throat> family line who is uh, literate and who has studied uh, done higher studies. So maybe the internet in future will help do some changes or radical changes rather. Um, I have another question for, for you that have you ever been to India before? I haven't yet, but I, I really, really want to, to visit India as soon as the, the COVID situation is improved and as soon as I will have some money, uh, I'm already planning with my sister, who is also an activist, that we will, that we will come together. Uh, I have many, many friends in India and Pakistan and I, I very much want to spend a month or two traveling around meeting some of my friends in real life and researching our roots. Yeah, exactly. That was my point that uh, I think that when you visit India, probably you will unearth some more secrets or lost information, which probably uh, there are more well-read people like you only can understand. And an additional question is that, do you have representatives? Again, I'm asking representatives, but do you have a Roma group uh, the representatives in India also who are trying from within India to help Roma people outside of India or in Europe? I know the, there is one group which I, I believe is based in Chhattisgarh, but again there is some question about whether the, the people involved are actually uh, Roma at all and whether they're speaking for us. We, this, this, seem, this problem goes right through our, our communities that we have people who are not uh, Roma claiming our identity and um, trying to usurp our position. Um, we really, I think, have to, as you say, use the power of the internet, use the fact that some of our younger people now are getting a good education, finally, to, to build organisations that genuinely speak for us and are democratic, so that say each group of Roma in each locality can send one representative to a, a Roma parliament where we can then decide our policy and we can then send representatives from that parliament to talk to the Indian government, to talk to the governments of Europe and to try to negotiate something better for us so that we can finally uplift ourselves and get out of the terrible poverty and discrimination that we face. 
Yeah, I I hope so that uh, this voice uh, should increase a lot. And uh, I I, it's uh, it's as I said, it's rather unfortunate that it's been. And you also said that in 21st century, this should not be the case anymore for any people of any race or caste or country or whatever. Uh, and people now should have understood the actual reality of humans. But well, uh, we are stupid. We are stupid monkeys with brain or something like that. <laughs> so, sadly, that's that's true. Yes, we. I have to say, in fairness, also we ourselves are part of the problem. Um, unfortunately, we do have the the classically Indian temperament that we, we fight among ourselves far too much. And, yeah. and I'm sure that is part of the problem. We have to grow up. I don't know which part of evolution we are in, but uh, this evolution should end pretty quickly because these lives which we are wasting because either of evolution of our or of our own stupidity it's just unnecessary people should grow yes, up I, very I agree pretty soon. humanity mm -hmm. should grow, grow up yeah. I, I agree and in fact I, uh, again on the subject of silliness among my own people even though we we are confirmed enemies of the caste system because of our own low caste origins some of the uh, Roma groups in in Europe having reached Europe invented their own caste system so that some Roma look down on others, and I think that's tragic, because we we of all people should know what's problematical about the caste system, because that's ultimately how we came to be in Europe and not in India, and yet some of the Roma groups have invented their own caste system. Well, uh, as we have discussed about the origin, culture, and influence of the. Uh, all over the world. As you also have said in the starting, the, the reason behind your interest in the history is this lack of uh, uh, information available regarding Roma people, or if it is available, it is incorrect information. So I would like to understand what is the research going on on Roma history? There's, un unfortunately, as you, as you say, there are far too many people who, who are not Roma, but have made money by writing about us. And a lot of what they've written is completely wrong. Um, historical research is difficult. One of the reasons is that the sources available have in many cases confused uh, Roma with other groups. Um, for example, some of the ancient writers used words like um, Tsigani to mean any kind of nomadic person, whereas the that word in medieval Romanian actually means a slave. Um, so it's very hard to, to tell in these sources whether they're talking about slaves whether they're talking about white nomads of European origin, whether they're talking about Roma, whether they're talking about some of the other Indian groups who are found in Europe, like the Rudari, for example. They, they are of Indian origin, but they're not Roma. Uh, and again, there's often a confusion between uh, Rudari and, and Roma. Uh, there's another group called the Chisaparia, who are found in, in Russia, who are also Indian. They are much more recent migrants to Europe than we are. And in fact, they're very interesting. I've done some research on them, but they're not Roma. And again, people get that confused. So it's it's very hard to disentangle the, the reality when the ancient sources are talking actually about Roma and when they're not. And also there's such a lot of total nonsense talked about us. If you read books written about us by outsiders, they often talk they say really bad things about us, saying that we're all criminals or we're all dirty or things like that. And actually, that's completely not true. We, uh, with regard to the, the claim that we're dirty, we, as you'd expect for Indians, have very strong purity laws and we're very, very strict about our hygiene. Um, and yet there is this stereotype that's very prevalent in Europe that says that we're dirty. Uh, we, we need to go right back to grassroots to 
write our own history correctly and destroy all of these lies about us that are that were simply created to to demonize us and to paint us as the bad guys well uh, it is quite sad that people when they are working on a history and they start putting their own pers perceptions and then the history become corrupted <laughs> oh that's quite sad uh, okay so when we are talking about this this research part so how are these evidences actually being gathered abhimanyu is uh, is it through archaeology hello uh, can you ha you have to repeat this question your network is very bad and we lost half of the question okay sorry no Just... we can't do anything don't be sorry okay. I, i i think i figured out what the question was um there isn't really anything we can do archaeologically because having been nomads until very recently or nowadays the majority of roma do live in houses like anyone else but until very recently most of us were nomadic so there's really nothing that we can dig up to tell us anything about the past but we do have sources where european historians have mentioned us um as long as we can unpick those and check that they are referring to roma and not some other group we can we can use them and we also have a lot of useful information in our own stories legends and above all our language so for example we know very securely what route our, our ancestors took on their migrations because of the loan words in our language you know, among i have mentioned earlier in the interview my own dialect of romani has loan words from persian armenian turkish greek southern slavic romanian hungarian german and french if you if you put those points on the map and draw a line you can see exactly what the route was that took my ancestors from india to western europe um there are many other uh points of linguistic archaeology that we can do uh, um I'll quickly tell you about another of my pieces of recent linguistic research. In in my dialect of Romani, the we have the word for a turkey, the bird, um which is strange, it's gadra, which word doesn't exist in any other dialect. And we didn't nobody knew where it came from. I managed to trace it. It's a very old dialect word from a very small part of Germany. that was used in the 15th century uh, in a particular part of bavaria in, in southern germany it was godara in medieval german and therefore that very usefully pins down both the time and place when my ancestors crossed from what's now czechia into what's now germany because they they picked up that word so they must have gone through that small part of germany during the 1400s and it's it's linguistic archaeology like that that gives us a lot of our best history about um the timing and location of our migrations uh chani i have uh, just a question came into my mind uh, because as you said that uh, they all started uh, migrating from india and india has a very i shouldn't say pleasant temperature but it is more favorable to humans than the cold temperatures of europe and uh, do you know the reason why they travel to the west and not to the east or even to russia oh we we did end up in russia but we um the the uh, roma in russia are another offshoot of the western european roma that i come from uh, a whole group of us who set out westwards from the balkans split up round about um Czechia and Poland some of us continued west and ended up in Germany France Netherlands Britain and others turned north and went through Poland Ukraine Russia and uh, i i think the reason that we always migrate westwards is that we have a we have a, a traditional belief that you can find your destiny in the setting sun and so you go you go west yeah but it is quite difficult because you have to cross deserts 
you have to oh, yeah. cross big valleys then you go into a temperature which is so cold probably most of us cannot survive if we do not have uh, these modern clothes and modern room heatings and all mm-hmm. so it it is quite fascinating why humans do such some things <laughs> I, i i think some of our migration was driven by uh, persecution um certainly we know that at different times in the balkans there were persecutions against us uh and certainly the reason that my own ancestors came west from the balkans was because the romanians were enslaving us so we ran away from that so very often that that is what's been driving our migration but yes you you you're right that we have come from a much more pleasant climate into a more difficult climate especially in northern europe and that's actually reflected interestingly in some of our folklore in in uh, romani folklore our version of hell is it's not like the christian hell it's not even like naraka loka it's um our version of hell is cold wet muddy never stops raining and of course it's if a, a bunch of indians arrive in northern europe where the weather is terrible most of the time and we find that we can't move our, our carts that we're traveling on because the wheels are stuck in the mud and it never stops raining and it's cold it seems pretty much like hell to us and so that has passed into our folklore but what we call being yakotan which is hell um is instead of being fire or violence is cold wet muddy never stops raining uh does roma people also travel nowadays or they have pretty much settled down with their own houses and places and have you also traveled in your lifetime probably when you were uh, a kid and with your parents and grandparents yes i've i've i traveled for about 15 years and i i've lived in 10 different countries of europe but i would say probably 90 or 95% of roma now live in houses um just like anyone else but we still i think we still have a a culture that says it's it's normal to travel so for example i have relatives who have moved right across europe to find better jobs and to find places where there is less racism um a lot of my um, none, none of my family were in britain until quite recently and some of us have arrived here within the last 20 years simply because britain is one of the places in europe where the racism is is not bad and so a lot of us came here to try to make a new life so although in many cases we do live in houses we still consider it perfectly normal to move to a completely different country in fact just just yesterday i was talking with my sister uh who lives in london um about how britain is changing with the the recent political climate and how it's not the nice place it used to be and we were talking about where else in europe we can go without worrying too much we'll just you know if we decide it's better in netherlands or somewhere like that we'll just go yeah or sweden i mean it's uh, yes. sweden is a good place uh oh, one more uh, question chandini is that uh, when you uh, when you travel from one country to another right now in europe so how do you do it and uh, what is the motivation and the thought process behind uh, this uh, constant traveling by the roma people initially too i understand that they migrated because of persecution and because of the caste difference but why is it continued for so long there, there are two reasons um those of us who uh, who lived nomadically um it was really necessary for our survival because of the kind of work we did um a lot of my own family if i go back say two or three gen- generations the, the men did seasonal agricultural work they w- did metal work repairing farm in- implements uh sharpening knives making a bit of jewelry for people um all of us were musicians we would we would put on shows to entertain people most of the women did healing and magic um but there isn't enough demand for any of those services for us to stay in one one town or village forever we have to move on so that that's the first part the second part even which applies to even those of us who have settled down and live in houses is that often 
we are treated badly. It may be difficult to get education for our children. It may be difficult to find work for the men. Um, and so we will try somewhere else. So for example, a lot of my relatives from Central Europe have come further west where the racism is much less bad. So in, in recent years, there's been a, a very large movement from Central Europe into um, Germany, Netherlands, Britain, Sweden, Norway, where, where there is much more equality. I see. Uh, uh, one more question came to my mind. I, uh, uh, many questions come to my mind. Uh, uh, is that, are there any customs or uh, what should I say? Maybe a rules which are uh, for traveling and uh, which, which you always follow that, okay, at this time of the year, we should start traveling to this place or to this direction or something like that. It's, it, it's very common for those of us who are nomadic to have a, a kind of a, a set route where, say, in September we go to this town, in October we go somewhere else, then in the winter we, we don't travel because the weather is too terrible. Um, it, it's not governed by sort of religious beliefs or culture, it's simply practical that if we establish where where we can find work, where we can find food at different times, we will follow a, a fairly set route. Um, when I was traveling, I, I actually traveled quite, ran quite randomly because I, I'm very fortunate that being, uh, as well as a linguist, I'm also a trained scientist. And it wasn't too hard for me to find good jobs. So I would, I would get a job, work for a few months, and then if I got bored, I would give that up. I had some, uh, you can live very cheaply if you live in a caravan, of course. So I, I could save most of the money I earned. And then for a few months, I didn't need to work at all. I could just travel. And then I'd, I'd settle down somewhere else and work for a bit. And I actually enjoyed that life very much. The, the only reason I, I settled down really was that I had some health problems about 25 years ago that made it very hard to travel. And so I, I switched to, to living in a house. And to, be, to think about it, I would rather love that type of lifestyle, to work for six months and travel. I love traveling. Mm -hmm. uh, but well, uh, uh, kids like us right now here in this podcast, all three of us has made our own routes now. And th these routes are so deep that for us to get up and travel, I, it's, it's like a dream for us. We have to plan maybe for one, one and a half years to travel to some place only for 10 days. <laughs> yeah, I understand. For us, it's, it, 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 we're, we're different. It's, if, if one of my relatives in some different city or even in some different country needs me, I will just throw some things in a suitcase, get in the car and go. That's, that's how I am. Hmm. And you told that uh, some people have already written about uh, Roma people and uh, uh, but right information and correct research is very much essential. So uh, can you suggest some good and reliable books? Uh, I'm uh, specifying that particular word that's reliable books mm -hmm. about the history which we can read to know even more about the Roma history. Hon honestly, I have not found any book that is reliable. The, the reason for that, I think, is that until very recently, all of the books written about us were written by outsiders and they made a lot of mistakes. And okay. in many cases, they wrote very insulting things about us as well because of the prejudices. Um, there is one book, um, which is it's called the, the Roma, written by uh, two Roma authors called Cherenkov and Lederich, which is... It's not bad, but there are some serious inaccuracies in it. The, the biggest inaccuracy, um, I think, is uh, regarding religion, because the two authors themselves are Christian. They've completely ignored all our traditional beliefs. And to me, that's a very bad omission because they're so important to us. And even many of the Christian Roma, as I mentioned, still keep some of the old beliefs in parallel with Christianity. 
uh, and yet that's left out. Yeah. So the, the the fact that there is such a, a deficit of accurate material is exactly what prompted me and my friends to set up our school of, of Romani studies and why I'm writing books myself to, to document some of the knowledge that I've got before I'm too old to do that. Okay. Uh, I think that uh, whenever you finish your, at least for the first book, you should just, uh, now we are friends on Facebook, you can just give me a message and then we will call you back again and we will discuss about your book. Maybe it would be wonderful to know about it. And yeah, uh, we 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 are we will wait for your book, and I will ask you probably if you uh, feel sometimes maybe that you do not want to write, I will ask you a question. Have you finished the book? <laughs> okay. <laughs> because uh, as I as uh, Navin was also saying that the reliable information is, uh, you know, I, I have at least read uh, three different stories of the origin of Roma people, and whenever this happens, I do not trust each any of the stories. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, yes. I I am lucky enough, fortunate enough that I had a contact with you, that I have a real Roma person who is willing to tell me about the real Roma people. So uh, I am very happy, and I I am very sure that my co-hosts are also very happy. Um, right. Thank you. Thank you. Chani, one thing is that. Uh, this is a thing with where I, I want to know much more about you because everything is about history. But when you say that you are a you are a witch and practicing witch, what exactly does that mean? And what is witchcraft in 21st century? Because we all are engineers here. And you, as you also said that you are a trained scientist. So how does it work right now? Enlighten us a little that's, bit. That's a good question. Uh, the... The word witch in English is the nearest translation I can give to our word Chavahoni, which means a practitioner of the, the magical arts, primarily healing. Um, that's the, the biggest um, part of my work as Chavahoni, but also uh, things like predictive magic, fortune telling, um, if necessary, using magic combatively, cursing people if they do something bad, um, that's certainly possible. Um, myself, I don't find a, any conflict between my scientist brain and my witch brain, because I, I believe that what we call magic is simply something that hasn't completely been understood scientifically yet. And I believe the mechanism is actually down to quantum mechanics. After all, it's, it, we, we know that um, in the quantum mechanical universe, the observer makes a difference to the outcome of any quantum interaction. I, I'm inclined to think that magic is a kind of macros macroscopic development of that. I think that there, there will be in the future maybe some interesting research that will account for so-called magic in a scientific manner. I, I, I don't at all think that the two are incompatible, but I, I have enough experience and I have enough magical skill myself that it would be crazy to not believe in, in the existence of the magic. So how did you get into it? I mean, it was it your own interest or was it because uh, it was traditionally passed out in your family it's traditionally passed in my family it's on it passes on the maternal line and the women in my family have been chavahania for many many centuries probably right back to before we left india because it, it is a hereditary um occupation and my my grandmother realized when I was very, very young, around two years old, that I had the skills. And so she trained me so that I would eventually be her replacement when she died. And I have kept those traditions to the best that I can. And now I am teaching the next generation to, to keep those skills. Um, don't you think that when a scientist and a 
a historian also talks about uh, being a witch the cred credibility is questioned by the other people who do not believe in witchcraft at all i think some people do do think that but does it bother but you at all not really no because to to me the the spiritual and magical part of our culture is so important that if i if i neglected it to to gain credibility uh, as a sort of western style historian i would feel that i was being a traitor to myself and to my people um of course some people may say that the healing that we do is is simply psychological it's a placebo effect and maybe, i'm sure there is to some extent a placebo effect there but there are also there are also things that are undeniably real effects there things that i have done that i couldn't possibly have known by orthodox methods if you like um and this is why many why people are willing to pay me good money to do to do magic for them they they wouldn't do that if they didn't believe in it uh, but why do uh, why do you, i mean i'm just asking for to you personally why do do you, do you do it is it because you like helping people and it gives a uh, pleasure to you from inside or do you do it just to practice this art and continue this tradition of witchcraft and pass it on to the other the next generation it's deeper than that to, to me having this having those skills is a gift from god and mm. so i have a an obligation to to use those skills to help people and similarly i have an obligation to pass those skills on to the next generation so that they're not lost and uh, and how how do you how do you practice it uh, was it like uh, your mother like my mother used to teach me whenever i do not do my homework i used to uh, she made me sit down on the dining table and made me do the homework while she was sitting and chopping the vegetables so how did does your mother and your ancestor taught you um mostly practical i would go with my grandmother to do healing watch what she was doing do a bit myself as i got older um things like interpreting um the doria the the um future paths of reality uh again watching over my grandmother doing it she explained the theory to me i started practicing myself to do it um the the basic ability we believe is in the blood but with with teaching it becomes a skill that you can use so select that this is why we select somebody who has the the basic abil ability to train not everybody can become chavani you have to ha have the the gift but then training makes it into a a useful skill by basic ability do you mean that a uh, special mental capacity and a strong will power or and uh, no male is just a, a tendency to help people what do you mean by the special ability yes there's there are there are two sides to it there's the the mentality the ability to use your mind to to influence reality um there's also a, an ethical and moral dimension to it being motivated to help people having a strong sense of right and wrong understanding about karma because we we believe very very strongly that misuse of magic comes back very hard against the person misusing it and so we have very strict rules about what we can and can't do with magic and also restrictions on who we teach the the magical skills to so for example i would be allowed to teach how to protect yourself from somebody using black magic on you i can teach that to anybody there's no problem because that kind of magic can't be used to do harm but magic for cursing or binding people absolutely i must not teach that to anyone except for my chosen successor because that magic is very dangerous and could be very badly misused hmm uh, don't mind me asking that but magic as an english word is always associated with illusion is there some other word which uh, you can use instead of magic 
That's a difficult one, yes, because the word changed its meaning in English. In 500 years ago, the word magic in English did mean actually influencing reality. Now, of course, it has become stage magic, illusion. And it's, it's a difficult concept to translate. Similarly, with the word witch, um, in the modern world, witches are, are seen as evil. But a few hundred years ago, the English word witch meant a wise woman, a healer, someone who, who was skilled at herbalism, who knew how to fix your headache or whatever it might be wrong with you. Um, and again, because of the coming of Christianity, its, uh, it's meaning has, has actually changed quite a lot from being something very positive to being something bad. And that's kind of unfortunate. This is why when I write about those skills, I usually use the uh, Romani word Chavahoni rather than the English word witch to avoid those negative connotations. Uh, have you, have anyone uh, ever, I mean, a, a real science scientist or a real, like uh, you, uh, have ever debated with you about this witchcraft and have you ever uh, discussed about it? I mean, pragmatically. I, yes, I have. Um, I have advanced the, the idea that it is basically some kind of quantum mechanical phenomenon. And it, interestingly, I know that a lot of leading edge research physicists uh, are also quite open to mystical beliefs because I think simply having a deep understanding of just how strange the quantum mechanical world, world is um, makes them with observer mediated phenomena, for example. And that's kind of crazy um, in terms of classical Newtonian mechanics, let's say. That's a, a, a rather crazy idea, but it seems to be correct. And once you admit that, that the quantum world that underpins everything is actually so weird, it, it's no longer seems quite so far fetched mm. that that some kind that some kind of observer mediated magic is possible. And how often do you do it? Uh, I mean, the practice and uh, and is there uh, any chance of improving? Not improving. What should I say? Uh, adding new arsenal in that magic, like there is an evolution in science we have uh, a gadget uh, every new every new year we have a new iphone so there are always increments in this technology so is it also happening in this oh yes world? yes the my my own skills in magic have increased a lot since i was a little girl and they're still improving as i learn to make better use of, of what i have and i've also develop new ways of using the magic. For example, a couple of years ago, I a friend of mine had a stroke and I had no idea whether our healing magic could be used for people who had strokes. But my friend was desperate. She was in a bad way. And so I tried and it made a huge difference. And I've subsequently done it with other people who've had strokes as well. And so I, I believe I've added something new to our repertoire of, of healing skills. This is fascinating. And I really want to ask you so many questions about it because I'm very interested. And But I will not ask so many questions. Uh, we can have a whole new two-hour podcast about this topic okay. in future. Sure. I, 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 I will discuss about this because today our main motive is for uh, the historical uh, details of Romani people. And, I think if we talk about this too much, people might forget what we have already discussed in the past. So, but uh, now we have two podcasts line, line, lined up with you. One is when you release your first book and the other will be of, about this witchcraft. And uh, I hope that uh, we learn uh, some witchcraft and yeah, this Corona should go away somehow. I don't know. I hate it. <laughs> and uh, when you come to India, just, just contact me. I would love to meet you. I will. I will. That would be great. Yeah, yeah. and uh, probably I will show you around at least in Mumbai. <laughs> so, 
uh, I think uh, we have covered all the things that we thought of today. And uh, do you have any last words before uh, we close this podcast? Uh, I think only to say thank you very much for having me. And I, 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 wish, I wish health and prosperity to, to everyone in India. You are my brothers and sisters. Namaste. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I think it's time to close this podcast. Please like, share and subscribe our channel and will help us grow this ecosystem which we are trying to build. And thank you. Adios. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.